Hey everyone, it's Victoria with Nutrition by Victoria. Long time no talk. I have had a baby in the meantime. This is my son. Uh, so I had a boy this time around. And today's video is about my successful VBAC story. So uh, previously I had had a C-section with my second child and with this pregnancy, I wanted to try for a vaginal birth after a C-section. That's what VBAC stands for. And I successfully did that with my little man. So uh, I'll just start with when I went into labor. So that was, uh, he's actually two weeks old today, so I'm two weeks postpartum. And uh, yeah, so the time has actually flown by pretty quickly. I'm <laughs> pretty tired because uh, the newborn stage is very exhilarating, but very exhausting as well. And I'm still recovering from delivery, but to get right into my delivery story, um, on September 12th, I went into labor at 2.45. In the morning, I was woken up with a contraction and what followed from there was a series of contractions that continued uh, all throughout that morning. I actually had uh, my 39 week um, prenatal appointment that day. So I went in at 11.45 for my appointment. At that point, my contractions were about two to five minutes apart. Uh, so it's like as soon as I left the house, my contractions started getting stronger. And keep in mind, this is the first time that I actually felt my labor. Um, I had a vaginal delivery with my first child, Lily, and I was about four centimeters dilated for a few weeks <laughs> leading up to when I um, had to be induced at 41 weeks and four days. So my labor had stalled out at four centimeters, but I never felt anything <laughs> to get to those four centimeters. This time around, when I went in for my prenatal appointment, I was um, not surprised <laughs> that I was only two centimeters dilated um, amongst my contractions. I had, had been having Braxton Hicks contractions um, pretty much the whole month, like, Prior to delivery, um, on and off, my body was just getting ready to, you know, have the baby. Um, and then every week, they, the, the Braxton Hicks started to come more frequently and more regularly until, you know, I finally started labor on the 12th. Uh, my due date was September 18th, but I had had an early ultrasound that showed that the baby um, was bigger than what they thought um, in an early ultrasound. Um, I had went for like a first trimester screen and he needed to be um, in the first trimester, but his measure, he measured big for the test so they couldn't run it. So then they had adjusted my due date to September 10th, but then on the anatomy ultrasound, they had adjusted it back to uh, the 18th. So uh, my due date, I always, said was going to be between the 10th and the 18th and he was born on September 13th. So getting back into my um, labor story, um, unfortunately uh, I wasn't feeling good leading up to when I did go into labor. I, I was having like cold chills and aches and um, headache. Um, I, I may or may not have had a fever. I was having night sweats. Um, so I wasn't really feeling that good leading up. And oh, I did have a little bit of nausea as well. And I also, so I was pretty tired out. I wasn't sleeping that well. And I wasn't eating as much as I probably should have <laughs> as well too. So these are just things to keep in mind as you, you know, hear out my labor story. Um, so my doctor suggested that I go into the hospital um, because I was a VBAC. So they generally want you to go in earlier because 
whenever your labor starts and you are a VBAC, you are at risk of uterine rupture. So originally I was actually going to opt for a home birth midwife with this pregnancy, but because of my risk for rupture, I decided to play it safe. <laughs> and this video really is just to bring awareness to anyone who is interested in having a VBAC, kind of what to expect because I wasn't 100% sure <laughs> on what I was, you know, expecting um, from at least the hospitals and their you know, uh, regimen in taking care of somebody who is a VBAC. So, um, also I did qualify for a VBAC. That's something that I should mention too, uh, that not all women qualify for a VBAC. Um, so going for a vaginal delivery after a C-section. Um, I was five years out from my last uh, childbirth. So five years since my C-section, I had a horizontal incision um, and, the, and it healed very nicely. And I had had a vaginal birth prior to my C-section. And the reason why I had a C-section was because the child was breached. It had nothing to do with my body, it just had to do with her positioning. So that makes a difference when it comes to, um, <laughs> he's just leaping away. Uh, when it comes to, um, you know, what <clears throat> if uh, you can do a trial of labor after cesarean. So that's another or like term they use, a toe lack, um, for somebody who wants to attempt a VBAC. So, Okay, um, because I knew I was only two centimeters and the doc wanted me to go in, I really wanted to labor at home and so I told him that I was going to not go into the hospital until later. Um, and I'm glad that I stayed home. So I went home and I listened to music and I <laughs> jumped on my cell exerciser and used my exercise ball and just, you know, I really should have taken a nap. I wanted to take a nap, but um, my husband and my mom were both kind of like encouraging me to go into the hospital even though I knew that like I just wanted to labor at home so I did that as long as possible and we started to head to the hospital at like 7 30 at night at which time uh, the doctor on call was <laughs> starting to blow up my phone uh, wondering where I was at so I got there around 8 o'clock at night and by that time I was three centimeters. I did opt for a membrane sweep at that point. Um, and I was still having regular contractions. They were painful, but they weren't like, it wasn't, it just felt like menstrual cramps. It kind of kept coming and going in waves. Um, but it wasn't anything that was, you know, unbearable. And that's because it was early labor too. So, um, they suggested that I uh, get um, uh, IV port put in, which I <laughs> tried to decline, as well as a fetal heart rate monitor, a continuous one. Um, and I tried to decline that as well <laughs> because I, I wanted to like ha be able to move around on my own during labor. And um, so they actually hooked me up with a, um, wireless monitor which was nice even though it kind of like was uncomfortable to have <laughs> installed on my body um and uh but it was nice that i wasn't just like hooked up to the, a computer the whole time so i tried to decline these things but they told me because i was a v-back that it was in my best interest as well as that of the babies to use the have this stuff hooked up because the fetal heart rate monitor uh, watches my contractions as well as the baby's heart rate and apparently they can use that to um so, uh, what am i trying to say <laughs> see if your uterus is going to rupture basically like there's warning signs i guess that can occur as well as like bleeding so I said, okay, um, these are things that were not disclosed to me prior. Um, I'm not sure what I was expecting going into this hospital birth situation 
and trying to decline medical intervention. Um, I think I just had the idea that they would just um, watch me, not like necessarily monitor me, but it's the healthcare system, so they want to, you know, they just want me and the baby alive at the end of the day, regardless of what it takes to get there. Um, so yeah, I had the IV port set, and then with this pregnancy, I also tested GBS positive. It was my only pregnancy that I've tested GBS positive for, and if I can reflect on that, I'm really not sure why I tested positive other than the fact that I cycled a lot, <laughs> um, and um, I also unfortunately what am and was iron deficient anemic, which I found out through blood work that I um, got at two in the morning um, at the hospital. So that can make you more susceptible to infection. Um, and then I also found out through that blood work that I got back at like 2.30 in the morning um, that I had had some kind of an infection. My white blood cell count was high. My um, neutrophils were high. Uh, so those are all, there was another one too, another marker. So I was iron deficient anemic and I had had some kind of an infection. <laughs> so uh, I had declined the GBS antibiotics initially, and um, after I got that blood work back, I, I went for the GBS antibiotics, which is just penicillin. I was going to decline as long as I was healthy. Um, according to the UK, they only recommend using penicillin for GBS positive patients. Um, if there's signs of active infection, if your water's been broke for 18 hours, if you've had a previous baby that's had a GBS infection, and there's one other stipulation for that, but because I saw that I had that infection, I was like, well, I guess I'll do the penicillin. Um, so that was kind of interesting because it burns your arm. Uh, it's called a, it like irritates your blood vessels. Um, so I could only handle that on really like, uh, it just, the penicillin runs for like 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the rate at which you can handle it. And so by the time I had my fourth dose, <laughs> which they give you a dose every four hours, um, I was, uh, pretty burned out from that and, um, had them basically trickle it into my uh, vein at that point. Anyways, um, so getting back to, okay, so I had already been in labor for 24 hours. I hadn't slept and I barely eaten anything because I wasn't feeling good. So, and when I don't feel good, I really can't eat much, especially when I'm in pain. So I had had a naked juice smoothie, probably about half the container. Um, the, the day I went into labor as well as some lemonade and that was it. So probably not even a thousand calories. Um, and then I was put on clear liquids when I went into the hospital because I'm at risk of uterine rupture and that would require surgery. So I was on clear liquids. I was sipping on apple juice, which, um, at least like had me getting some sugars in. Um, and I wasn't able to sleep that night, um, the night I was in the hospital because I was in the hospital, I was excited. And also I, the, you know, you got people coming in to check on you like every two hours or so. It's kind of like <laughs> just preparing you for when the baby comes, I guess. Um, I wasn't real active in, that night. Maybe I did some walking in the hallway, um, but I preferred during my pregnancy as well as when I was in the hospital to one, have my um, maternity pillow with me, which is like a big like bolster type pillow. It's kind of in a shape like this and uh, just really comfortable for side laying, uh, which is what I preferred, how I preferred to rest and sleep while I was pregnant. Um, I really preferred to lay on my left side and there's significance to this because as, um, I'm laying there and like every, you know, hour I would flip sides. Um, 
Well, it was about 5.30 in the morning and I went to turn <laughs> onto my left side and I probably was laying there for about 30 seconds and my water just exploded everywhere. <laughs> it was pretty epic because I um, didn't have my water break with Lily, uh, my oldest daughter, um, until it, it like broke partially and then I had to have my water broken. And I was actually considering having my water broken um, if it wasn't gonna break on its own. Uh, just cause when you're in the hospital, you're really on a timeline. Um, I had like I said, already been in labor for 24 hours and I wasn't sure like how long they were going to let me go, uh, before they were going to, you know, elect for a C-section. So anyways, my water broke at 5:30 in the morning. So at that point I had been in labor for 27 hours, um, from the start of my contractions. I got really excited after my water broke cause I'm like, yeah, like let's get this show on the road. You know, my cervix was checked at, uh, around 8:30, 9 o'clock the next morning and I was dilated to four centimeters. So that's like the bridge between like uh, early labor and getting into active labor, um, that transition. And um, so I tried to be as mobile as possible, but they did like at one point take the wireless um, monitor off because it stopped working and hooked me back up to like the regular fetal heart rate monitor, which had me restricted to like a three foot tether. <laughs> um, uh, but at some point they did let me shower and just take everything off, which <laughs> made me feel like an animal who got out of a cage and was free <laughs> uh, to just like shower. I was, I know mentally I was starting to get, I just, I don't like feeling confined. I like. You know, I, I, I like my freedom of movement um, and in the hospital I was definitely, um, that was taken away so I don't think that that helped anything and um, so I had my cervix checked again at 4 p.m. and uh, at that point, you know, I was 36 hours into labor and I'm looking at almost 12 hours with my water broken and I was still only at 4 centimeters. and. Prior to that, my lab, my I was still having contractions, but they had died out. Um, and I think that a big reason why that happened was because I hadn't slept and I hadn't eaten much in those 36 hours. Um, so at that point, my doctor suggested uh, low dose pitocin. You have to be careful with an induction medication with a VBAC patient because. Um, that can cause uterine rupture. Uh, so I started the Pitocin. I actually cried a shit ton <laughs> first because I was pretty uh, sad that I was needing um, to have induction medication. But I also was very aware that, you know, if I don't get things moving, then I'm looking at a C-section. If I was home, I'd be able to rest and just take my time with it. So that's just something to keep in mind too if you're considering a home birth and you're not a VBAC, um, that you have more time to labor because you're at home and there's no like timeline um, for you. So uh, I opted for the Lotus Pitocin. <laughs> they started that and the contractions hit real hard and I was like, heck no, I'm not doing this without an epidural. I had had induction medication with my first child delivery and I um, went a long time before I opted for the epidural, but like I hadn't been in labor prior to that. So I had the induction medication and it was hardcore. I went through it and then I got to a point where I couldn't handle it anymore and I went for the epidural. So with this, because I had been in labor for so long already and hadn't slept and hadn't eaten, I was like, give me the epidural. I'm not doing this without an epidural. And I knew that, you know, you put those two together, you put the Pitocin and the epidural together and your baby's coming out. At least that's my, that was my experience with my first. So I kind of figured that that would be, you know, how things would roll with this one too. So 
Uh, after they shut the Pitocin off, before I got the epidural, I feel like I did dilate more um, because my the way that my back, low back and like the back of my legs felt, it felt like a little, like I had some numbness going on because the baby had dropped, right? Uh, so then epidural was set and uh, I got to rest and I, I didn't go to sleep. <laughs> I, I um, had a little like fruit ice cup and um, what else kept sipping my apple juice and just rested and like I just I the epidural was dosed so low because I had a previously uh, really bad experience with an epidural when I was um, having my second child uh, I basically just kept blacking out because my blood pressure kept dropping too low and that was um that's an issue that I end up having with my pregnancies in general is that my blood pressure is really low especially towards the end uh, my blood pressure was running like 90 over 50 uh <laughs> pretty much the whole time I was in labor um so they dosed my epidural really low I was also on IV fluids the IV fluids really made a difference too and just like how I felt um especially since I had you know, had an infection when they started the IV fluids and that penicillin, I actually felt better after having that. Um, but then, you know, the penicillin just kept coming. And by that time I was like, Oh my God, no more. Um, but the one nurse I had, she was actually like, you know, you're probably going to have your baby soon. So, um, you know, you can not have that anymore. And I was like, yes, thank you for suggesting that. Cause I had had four doses and I was like, yeah, I'm good on that. Um, so, uh, after I had the epidural set, um, I could still feel my legs. They just felt a little numb and I could still feel the pressure, the contractions, just not the pain. And so it was freaking awesome. <laughs> I mean, this is the reality of having a child, um, and you're in the hospital setting. Like the, these are just things, you know, to be aware of and what your options are. The epidural for me does not hurt because the contractions hurt worse. Um, the penicillin going into my arm hurt worse. Having my cervix checked hurt worse than having an epidural put in. Um, so with the epidural, I was moving my legs from side to side every like 40 minutes. And um, after about two and a half hours, um, I'd say it was about eight o'clock. Um, so I had been in labor for 40, uh, 40 hours. Yeah. Over 40 hours. Um, I had turned on to my left side, um, again, and lo and behold, I feel the baby's head in my vaginal canal and I feel a lot of pressure. It feels full. It feels like I have to, uh, have a bowel movement and I'm like, okay, the baby's coming. And I'm asking my nurse to take my catheter out because they put a catheter in when you have an epidural. And I had to ask this chick like five times to take my catheter out. And that was really frustrating because uh, they have already told me that if I don't have this catheter taken out, um, I could damage my urethra. And I was like, look, the baby is coming. Like I, I need this out. Like I could literally feel like every contraction I was having was pushing him out more. So <laughs> finally uh, she took that out and I started pushing and then they actually made me stop pushing and then went to get the doctor. I was like, why isn't the doctor already here? Like, this is so weird. Um, and then I was almost like flat on my back while I was pushing. And then I had, I had a doula this time around. She was great. Um, I had her stack a bunch of pillows behind me and like raise the bed up. I was like, I really need to be like sitting up more. And I just feel like the nurse that I dealt with, she was a little like inexperienced when it came to like you know, maybe like a vaginal delivery or something or just, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to get into too much detail with that, but then the doctor comes in and yeah, the baby's coming out. They actually gave me a mirror to see, um, you know, how I was pushing, <laughs> which is pretty graphic and, uh, you know, watching as the baby's head was coming out and, um, then I had to slow the pushing down because the shoulder got caught. So I did suffer like a they called it a second degree vaginal tear, like internal one, um, did require about three stitches. <laughs> um, and I felt because my, um, epidural was dosed so low, I actually felt 
the pushing, I'd say about 90%, like I felt all of it. Um, so I was, you know, <laughs> when I finally pushed him all the way out, I had screamed. Um, but yeah, it was really cool to just experience that because when I pushed my first out, I, the epidural was, you know, dosed differently and I didn't feel anything really other than like pressure. So this is really cool to actually feel him coming out of my body. And I was, you know, had had a break from the pain. So it was actually like welcomed. Like I definitely feel like I have pretty good pain tolerance. Um, especially when I'm able to get a break just from like biking and stuff like his biking hills is hard. So I feel like it gives you some, you know, bit of an edge when it comes to pain tolerance and what you can handle. Anyways, yeah, so he comes out. He was just beautiful and I got him skin to skin and just held him on me for about the first hour. My husband cut the cord. We did delayed cord clamping and you could literally see that by the time the cord was cut, there was like, you know, not really any more blood left in it. Um, saw my placenta delivered. That was cool. And yeah, it was just how uh, vaginal delivery goes and um yeah baby was super healthy and that was that was about it um i didn't take any kind of pain medication afterwards i was just excited for you know that whole thing to be done and just let my body start to heal and um go from there. But yeah, so that is my successful VBAC story uh, that gave me this precious little gem here. Hello. <laughs> uh, but yeah, leave any comments or questions down below. That's it for this video. I'll talk more about breastfeeding and what I'm eating in a day um, coming up soon. Okay. Thanks for watching. Bye guys.